that form of big league. But there are other pros. So, to give you an idea of, of how faint those objects are, with a, with a telescope this big, we collect basically one photon a second. Not one photon per square meter per second. Not one photon per square centimeter. But one photon per telescope. Quite a few. <laughs> you need quite, well, think of it. Even to get a decent centroid, yeah. you need thousands of photons, right? To even say, okay, there's an object and where is it? You need thousands. Oh, sorry. But if you're but if you're going to make a spectrum to identify it by its redshift, you need a lot more than thousand. You need millions. Yeah. Is that your guys' goal, or...? Yes, oh, absolutely. This is the first light machine. It's going to be like a little army going. So there's there's definitely well, first light science. Uh, because we can take the images with the highest redshift, we can take them yeah. at, at intermediate zones. There's an instrument on here called the near-spec, near-infrared yeah. spectrometer. It means what's called a micro-shutter. It's able to take images, more importantly, spectra of hundreds of objects at once. Okay. So it can then understand things like luminosity and spin rate of galaxies as a function of cosmic time. Okay, the luminosity tells us the regular matter, the spin rate tells us, you know, the effect of gravity. Yeah. Right, good old fashioned Kepler. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I'm hoping, I, if, if I'm not connecting, just stop me and I'll explain it. Okay, so that's, that's theme two, that's outside the galaxy. Inside the galaxy, birth of stars and planets. So because we have a large infrared telescope, we collect light coming out of these nebula. Yeah. Right. You can't do that with shorter light because the dust and the it's molecules disappear. scatter the light out of the beam. Yeah. Okay, and then finally, uh, examination of stars and excuse me, planets and planetary bodies both inside and outside the solar system. So I like to call that solar systems ours and theirs. You really do have a cool job. So all of that requires an infrared telescope of large size. Yeah. And it does the two things that you need a big telescope for. Collecting a lot of light, D squared, okay, and high resolution, D. Lambda D. Okay. But it's bigger than a fairing. So that's got to get folded up. But because it's an infrared telescope, it's also got to be cold. So you, that's so we why you have the whole vibe where you're saying that you shake it to prevent it from getting too hot to the sunlight. Because it's designed for cold, but when we yeah. deploy it... You face it away from the sun. Well, the sun's then, always on the sun. And that's so where you have the, uh, oh, your solar panels there, because yes. that's how you're going to power right. the whole thing. Correct. So there's a, a sunny side and a cold side. Yeah, that's going to be very cold. That's the design principle, yes. And it needs to be very cold here, specifically because we want to turn off the black body radiation from the telescope itself. So we have to make a very sensitive instrument that black body radiation constitutes noise in that measurement. Yeah. How so long that's did it why take you to develop this? Uh, we were working, I mean, the first studies were in the, in the late 90s, about 97, and the last system review was in 2014, 2015. So it was a few weeks. <laughs> I wasn't born when it started. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, rem I remember reading books when I was young. You were talking about the James Webb telescope that was coming. Well, and, and in fact, uh, the very first studies that were done by NASA yeah. uh, started actually in the late 80s, early 90s, oh, wow. before Hubble had been launched. And, and that's cool. typical. That's exactly what we're. Do that's exactly what NASA science community is doing for the generation after this. So we just completed uh, studies of four large what are called decadal missions that are being examined by the sci scientific community in deciding what's next. So these things are very long gestation periods. Like I tell a lot of students that I go visit, it's if you're into patient. instant gratification, do not do what I do. But it's just the, like, it's admirable, like the patience that you have, that you've basically spent 
for me a lifetime mm -hmm. doing what you're doing in order to get results and then you're getting so close to actually seeing that coming alive and then like it's like That's when those scary. scientists they do an experiment and they're dead by the time they get results back and it's like yeah. Two generations later, well, it's, it's, that they're getting back those results of the experiment right. that they're like, and, oh my and god. There are scientists who've, who've devoted an equal amount, of, large amount of their career to developing the instruments that yeah. go on. So it's a, it's a long term commitment by both scientists and engineers. But when it's done, it's just you look back at it, it's amazing. I, I, I've spent the first nine years of my career at the company working with Chandra, which has now been operating for 21 years. And wow. it's simply one of the most prideful things I've ever done to get to contribute yeah. to something like that. It's, it's essentially. And then you see rare. the results coming in, and you're like. You know, and, and it's two things, right? Of course, it's great science, but as an engineer, which I am, yeah. you know, I like to see, you know, my customers are still happy to see me after 20 years. <laughs> which is what you want. You know, you know out, out, outside of. Uh, <laughs> certain decisions in life, there's not many things that you're still happy with after 20 years. Yeah. Not, not even that great car that you, you know. So it's, it's, it's incredibly gratifying just as a professional engineer. Just, I made a product, I, it wasn't yeah. just me, it was me and 500 of my closest, you know, colleagues. But we made something, the customer is still happy with it 20 years later. That's so amazing. It's, it's, it's quite gratifying. We'll get the same results out of web when we get launched. Uh, but I'm sure you will. So uh, where I was going was this telescope is cooled passively. Yeah. So this sun shield essentially is a is a parasol. Yeah, and you have turning all off the sun. The, uh, basically, by having the gaps, you're having insulation. Correct. So so basically, even though in this model these look a little parallel, uh, that's not. not they are definitely not. They, they oh, are yeah, you can see them in that one. So there's a couple yeah. of degrees of, of, of inclination. What that does yeah, is, like is, is, is it essentially guides heat out. Oh, wait, and so oh, you're essentially oh, pumping heat out the sides. Okay. And it always keeps that that spot is pretty so, cooler so than the rest of it. This is uh, about 90C, 350K. And up here, you're in the 50s and the 40s. And this is all... Basically, um, five in C or forties and fifties in C or this is about. I'll do it all in K, so we okay, can Calvin. keep it. Kelvin, Kelvin, here we go, Kelvin. Don't okay. just don't about three fifty. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's forty. K. K. Kelvin. Kelvin. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Pack a jacket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need more than a jacket. <laughs> but, from yeah. Canada. I'll bring a furnace. Yes. Yes. No, don't do that. <laughs> Uh, just watch from afar. I think that's the safest yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, so this is it, right? And so this is, uh, you know, the way, you know, previously infrared telescopes went into space, right? You put a telescope yeah. and a doer, and you put cryogen in there, right? And that's how you cool it. Well, well, you spend a lot of mass on the, on, the, on the doer, and you have a finite lifetime. Because eventually the cryogen, like the Spitzer telescope, eventually the cryogen is exhausted. Yeah. Right, because it's a, typically an open loop. Isn't that what they did with um, all the first satellite? I'm forgetting its name. Uh, this was the this was the common approach to uh, cooling them. infrared telescopes. So now, by doing this, you don't have a finite life on it. it it's governed by the propellant. Yeah, it's, it's not. Where are you keeping your propellant on here? Is it in that part under there? Correct. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason you want to keep it cool is because of how? Because of because we're trying to detect infrared photons. Okay. Uh, if we have a high temperature, we get those same kind of infrared photons. You can't tell whether they come from the sky or from the telescope. Okay. Okay. We're going to detect your salts. Yes. Well, and and yourself is overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <it's> dead. Right. <laughs> so you know, obviously, you want the the noise to be much less than the signal. We already told you the signal was from first light object was about one photon yeah, per telescope per second. So we have to get cold enough such that the contribution here is significantly below that. That's what drives the, the 40 Kelvin temperature.
the long wave instrument is attached to a cryo cooler and it's cooled actively with a closed loop helium refrigerator called the cryo cooler down to six Kelvin. But that's the only actively cooled part. This forty Kelvin is like because they're realistic number, or is it, or is as low as you can move it? No, no. So basically, so like zero Kelvin is zero, yeah. like absolute zero. Well, let's see. Forty is necessary. Okay, and uh, it's interesting to note that you could you could pick this satellite up, move it to the orbit of Jupiter, because we did that analytically. Uh, Essentially, that, that changes the solar constant from the solar constant at the Earth orbit to roughly 4%, right? Jupiter's 5 AU, yeah. you know, 125th, 4%. The temperatures here don't change. The temperatures here are limited by the conducted parasitics, yeah. which is a function of the electronics and the, and the structural connection. And so it, we've turned off radiation. Right, which, which largely means uh, as long as we keep the electronics stable as, as we move through the orbit, the telescope will remain stable. So the telescope is designed to be stable, low expansion mirrors, a tuned graphite structure to, to minimize the, the coefficient of thermal expansion. It's small, but it's not identically zero. So you want to keep the environment as, as stable as possible. Good. It also increases your life expectancy because then you'll have less expansion and contraction. Although there's a lot of strain going you know, from room temperature to cold. That's that's, that's going to be the big test. But we've already done that, right? So we've you know, demonstrated the structure itself will survive because it's been tested. The whole telescope, the whole system was tested at operating temperature optically at the Johnson Space Flight Center. And, and showed that it would behave uh, exactly as it, as it should. So that was a very successful test. Thank you so much. My pleasure. You're, a, you're, you're, you're an engineer and you've spent yes. an awful lot of time working on this. When, when we finally get to see it deployed, what sort of scientific results would you like to see coming back from it? So. Then, then I can put on my amateur scientist hat. I, we're going to learn more about the early universe with mm. this telescope in basically one day than humanity knows now, right? So, you know, I don't know what is going to get detected, but I know that every time humans have taken a new telescope and pointed to we the sky something. all the yeah. way back to yeah. 1609, yeah. we learned something we didn't expect. Yeah. So I, I, there's no reason to expect this telescope will be any different. So I'm, I'm sure we will have some great surprise about the early universe. I don't know what. Uh, and that, you know, that's the scientific side. And obviously, when, when this amazing piece of engineering works, uh, hopefully it will inspire people to, to, to dare even greater yeah. things. That's what I personally want to get out of it after my, my investment and that, and that of all of my colleagues everywhere to, uh, to say, hey, look at what we did. Imagine what we can do tomorrow. Right? Bigger telescopes, shorter wavelengths, more stable telescopes, all kinds of different signs. How far is this supposed to go? Hmm? How far is this supposed to travel? Our, our orbit is about a million miles away from the Earth, anti-summer. Yeah. Uh, in proximity to the second Lagrange one. Yeah. So essentially, we, when we go out there, we get, we get the benefits of being away from the Earth. Yeah. Uh, so that the Earth's heat and reflected light doesn't doesn't upset our, our thermal balance. Uh, we can hide the sun, the Earth, and the moon all behind the sun shield, which then allows the telescope a dark environment to collect light and dump its heat to space. Yeah. So it's an integral part. If you think of an Earth-based orbit, Earth-centered orbit, it doesn't work. So yeah, no. even if you're far away, at some point in that orbit, the sun's on one side, the Earth is on the other, and you're out of business. Yeah. So, so you're always going to keep. So we keep all the bright things on one side yeah. and get away from the Earth, but not so far that communication is a problem. Okay? And by being close to the second Lagrange point, we kind of get dragged around in this non-Keplerian orbit. 
So we orbit with the period of the Earth. Yeah. If you got dropped into a generic orbit at that radius, your yeah. orbital, your year would be 371 days, and eventually you drift away. So at the at the price of a little a little bit of propellant, we keep up. It's not a stable orbit, but that's we can invest that energy. Uh, and in fact, that's kind of beachfront real estate for most astrophysics missions, precisely because of distance from Earth, not having the Earth in the way, making scheduling yeah. easier, you get better access to the sky. It's not that far that you can't communicate yeah. a lot of data. Uh, there's, lots of, there's lots of orbital area for lots of missions. And it's, it's thermally stable. So our orbit, for example, has no eclipses. So Webb is on its its uh, battery only for about 45 minutes in the whole mission. From when we go off ground power to when we separate from the, the, the launcher and get the solar array out, which is the first and the only autonomous deployment. And at that point, the battery Obviously, it's a part of the electrical power system, but we never draw energy from it. You want to send those Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're university students, and uh, basically, us three were from the rocketry team, but he's actually from our satellite team who's working with the Canadian Space Agency to actually get a CubeSat up. So, like, oh. you understand what you're saying? Yeah. Well, better we do. I'm actually wondering what you were doing for communication systems on uh, as well. So, it's, it's a you know, KA band. Okay. Dish on the bottom. Dish here. Let's see. Oh, I see. Yeah. You know, we have twice daily contacts, deep space network. Pretty traditional uh, in, that, in that respect. Thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to you all. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh, if any of y'all would like to explore the James Webb uh, telescope. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you may not like this question, but at, at the end of the mission, um, is there a view to clearing the Lagrange point? Let's see. When we run out of gas, this is this is the best part. Yeah. Is it's essentially it's not a stable orbit. Yeah. So. So it'll do it so itself. It'll do it itself. Yeah. So we don't have to save fuel. It's not the just. You don't have to. Save a lot of fuel for a disposal maneuver, yeah, yeah. right? And our orbit is not at L two; it's in a five by eight hundred thousand kilometer orbit. There's a lot, right, of, a lot of space around there's it. A lot of space. Yeah, yeah. A, a relatively small spacecraft. <laughs> Very small spacecraft. Yes, and, you know nothing compared to. You know, e even the low Earth orbit has a lot of space between the spacecraft. Yeah. That is highly congested compared yeah. to L two. Launch next year? 2021. 2021. Year after. Yeah. You excited? Very. Fantastic. Very. Yeah, I can't wait. Best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you.